V2V or vehicle to vehicle communications technology is getting a head start this week. Joining us to talk about that is Sam Abu El Samid from Navigant Research. Great to have you back, Sam. Hey, Megan and Jason. Great to be back again. <laughs> it's awesome to have you back. So you wrote in Forbes about how Cadillac is now shipping sedans with V2V uh, capabilities. Is this is this kind of the first uh, time that we're seeing this in in kind of a large number in the U.S.? Yes, yeah, the first application in the U.S. market. Um, Toyota launched a couple of models with uh, V2V communications in the Japanese market in late 2015. Um, and they're probably going to start introducing some vehicles here in the next year or so, but they haven't made any product announcements here yet. But yeah, this this application is the first one here in the U.S. market, and we'll probably see at least a couple more from Cadillac before the end of this year. Wow. Okay. So what um, what capabilities does this bring to the supported Cadillacs at this point? Because I know, I know the long-term capabilities and the promise of V2V, but what do you get in the short term? So for this initial application, they've got uh, three messages that uh, are three different types of alerts that the system will provide to the driver. So what, what these do is the vehicles with V2V communications will broadcast messages 10 times a second when uh, the when the vehicle, if the um, stability control gets activated, indicating you're on a slippery road surface, uh, if the driver hits the brakes hard, indicating a panic stop, or if uh, hazard lights go on. And when that happens, that vehicle will broadcast the messages. It's a standard type of message that get broadcast to any other vehicle within about uh, a thousand foot radius. Uh, that has the V2V hardware built in. And then those vehicles will get an alert uh, in the dashboard, you know, indicating what what type of what's going on. So, you know, um, if the driver, you know, if, if somebody down the road um, suddenly slows down or, or swerves and the driver in front of or behind them hits the brakes hard, you'll get an alert before you get to that point. So you have more time to react and uh, slow down before you before hopefully before you get into an accident. So back in December, NHTSA proposed a mandate uh, to make V2V technology required in all new light vehicles. Uh, that was December. We are now in a new administration. What's going on with that now? So uh, there's been no uh, no decisions yet based on what's going to happen with that mandate yet. Um, at this point, uh, it looks like that's probably not going to get enacted. Uh, I mean, anything, anything can change, but based on the executive order that was signed uh, in early February that required that for every new regulation that gets enacted, two old regulations have to be rescinded. Uh, so that's probably going to keep the V2V uh, regulation from getting enacted anytime soon. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, GM is moving ahead with deployment of V2V, and we'll probably see, as I mentioned, Toyota and probably Honda. Uh, as the next companies that launch this technology uh, within the next year or so. And and the one of the things with the V2V mandate is, unlike a lot of regulations, it was generally supported by most of the industry. So uh, I think we'll see a, a bunch of different uh, car makers installing V2V hardware, starting to put their V2V hardware out into the marketplace over the next couple of years. Kind of take it into their own hands and and do it for um, yeah yeah you know, they probably already kind of set the wheels in motion no pun intended maybe a little right well there's intended. there's a lot of benefits to the technology um, yeah. especially you know as we go forward and start deploying autonomous vehicles in the early 2020s it's going to help a lot with those yeah for sure are uh, there any drawbacks to the technology I mean is there anything any reason why not to regulate this um, mainly I mean you know as with anything when you when you add some extra hardware to the vehicle there's going to be a bit of an additional cost uh, initially it works out it's estimated to be about three hundred dollars per vehicle but that's that cost is going to come down pretty rapidly um, especially since V to V uh, the current V to V uh, systems are based on um, basically it's a variation of, of Wi-Fi technology uh, just operating on uh, different frequencies, and uh, it's at 5.9 gigahertz, uh, and there's a specific messaging protocol. But you know, really, it's it's pretty straightforward. And uh, as the cost comes down, as it gets deployed in more vehicles, the cost is going to come down. And um, you know, I think eventually by by the mid 2020s, it will probably be pretty much universal uh, in the U.S. Even if there isn't a regulation, right? Um what about a standard here? Are, 
Is there actually a V2V standard right now? And if so, is it kind of a risk, or if not, I guess, is it kind of a risk to, to roll out V2V technology at this point without a standard in place? Yeah, actually, there is a standard. They, okay. The industry, uh, the automakers and a bunch of suppliers, as well as regulators, including the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, have been working on this stuff for more than a decade. Uh, and uh, SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, has uh, a couple of standards that cover uh, both the uh, the messaging protocols uh, for V2V as well as the actual message formats. Uh, so as long as everybody adheres to those standards, it it that should all be interoperable between uh, systems from different manufacturers. So you know your Hondas should be able to talk to GMs and Toyotas should be able to talk to Fords, um, and and then eventually uh, the hope is to also have um, have these V2V or uh, these DSRC radios, dedicated short-range communications radios on infrastructure like traffic lights mm -hmm. um, and utility poles and things like that so that it can transmit information about uh, traffic conditions, um, provide uh, light timing information to cars so that as you get into autonomous vehicles, they, they'll know when the lights are going to change uh, or you can also pro provide alerts to the drivers, you know, provide a countdown when the light's going to change that sort of thing. So you can hopefully get smoother traffic flow. So you said it's a it's a specific messaging protocol and that there there are standards in place. But I'm thinking of like the Internet of Things where, you know, it just is a mess. There are, there are standards, but, you know, my Nest won't work with HomeKit and this won't work with that. Um, and so do you think that, that the car makers have learned from that and they – uh, they will uh, keep to the standards or or will it be, you know, will we expect competition to lead to something like how, you know, Jason can't get my iMessage because he's on an Android phone? No, in, in this case, um, it's uh, I think the manufacturers are going to try and stick as close as possible to the standard uh, because they know that uh, this will only work if all vehicles can talk to all vehicles and as well as talking to infrastructure and pedestrians and cyclists. Um, if people start going off in di different directions and doing, you know, and having version, you know, something like iMessage versus Allo, um, it's never going to work and it's going to be completely useless. So um, the industry understands that and they're sticking quite close to it. In fact, here uh, in the Ann Arbor area, there's been a pilot project for the last four years uh, testing this with several thousand vehicles equipped with these, with this hardware, as well as, um, having it on uh, some of the infrastructure around the city of Ann Arbor to test uh, the, the equipment from different manufacturers and make sure it's all interoperable. So I think I don't think we'll see the sort of problems we have in uh, in the IoT world. I can uh, totally understand kind of the the benefit and the value of V2V, you know, when, when you're talking about cars talking to each other. What about uh, software companies? Like, you know, Google has its Maps product or Waze or Apple's Maps or whatever. Is there Are there plans or are there thoughts that this technology would also fold in in kind of like a third party way into um, software developers' hands? Yeah, that's that's actually um, part of what's going on, uh, you know, on the, as part of the, the extension of this into vehicle to infrastructure mm -hmm. um, to get data from vehicles and collect it and, and aggregate it. So I was actually um, in, uh, in, in uh, Virginia earlier this week uh, to do a presentation to uh, NEMA, the National Electric, uh, Electrical Manufacturers Association, uh, which includes companies that, that build some of these roadside units. Um, and and traffic sig traffic control systems things like that. Uh, so there's there's a, a number of companies that are developing uh, technologies, developing applications on the infrastructure side to collect some of this data, share it back to the vehicle fleets, also to share it to mapping companies. Um, so there's there's a number of ways that that this data will be spread out and used uh, to both uh, hopefully enhance traffic flow, improve safety. Uh, and also, uh, as we get into autonomous vehicles, uh, to make autonomous vehicle control more robust uh, by adding an extra layer on top of the sensors. Because the sensors, you know, those LiDAR sensors and radar sensors that you have on autonomous vehicles, you know, just like our eyes, they can only, they can't see through other objects, you know, so you're limited to line of sight. But the, um, the connect, the, uh, V, the, what we call V to X or vehicle to external communications, which is the broader umbrella term for all of this stuff, uh, can see further beyond line of sight 
and add extra situational awareness for the vehicles so they can make they can make more proactive decisions earlier on and hopefully give you smoother, safer control. Yeah, the more the more pieces of information it has, the safer you are. That's kind of the overall goal. Uh, exactly. Awesome. Sam Abuel Samid, really appreciate you taking time out tonight uh, to talk with us about this. Where can people follow all of your work online? Uh, you can find me at uh, navigantresearch.com, which is uh, my, my company's website, uh, where I'm a senior analyst on the transportation team. Uh, you can also find my writings on Forbes. Uh, and you can find me chatting every week with my friend uh, Dan Roth on the Wheel Bearings podcast at wheelbearings.media. Right on. Uh, appreciate it once again, Sam. Have a great weekend. Have you, you guys have a great weekend, too. Take we care. will. Take care. Bye-bye.